Welcome to Gold Street Garden. But I do think that Welcome back, Nate. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Feels good to be in my home church. Feels good to be back in America. I'm just so thankful to be here. Who's excited for tonight? It's going to be a good night in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Who's ready to get a fiery word from evangelist Joe Turnbull? I can assure you after traveling with him for, for two weeks and going, I think, 8,000 miles with him, and it's going to be a fiery word. He's, a, uh, he's an amazing man of God. I just want to honor him, and this house wants to honor him because if you knew Joe 10 years ago and then you've seen him now, it's a... It's, a, it's, it's the gospel unfolding in front of your eyes. He is a new creature, amen? And he has one thing on his heart, and that is to see God move everywhere he goes. He's a true evangelist at heart. No matter where he goes, I can be at a restaurant with him, and I'll look over, and he's, he's praying for a, a server, or he's, you know, he, he, if you know Joe, you know he'll even go in the back and, if he hears from the Lord to go pray for a cook, he'll do it. I mean, he's, uh, he's a true evangelist. He doesn't typically care about comfort or his feelings. He's all about making sure people hear who Jesus is. Tonight's going to be amazing. I can just feel it in my spirit. One thing I want to I say is that we don't know when tomorrow ends. For somebody else, you know, we don't know if someone's going to get another day. We don't know how much time even we have here on earth. And to value every single moment. And I just want to let you know I value every single one of you. And I know when I, as, I, as I speak for our pastors, we all value each one of you. And it, it's not just something we say to make people feel good. It's what we truly believe, that we're a family here. And that we steward every moment as best we can with each other. And we know that life is like water in your hand. And it just slowly seeps out. And you can't grab it back. Once it's out of your hand, it's gone. And that every single little moment is so precious. And every little conversation is so precious. And I'm even starting to realize this more and more as I grow with the Lord that don't miss it. Don't miss any opportunity. You know, I'm a barber by trade. And I'm really realizing that Every single moment someone's in my chair, yes, I've always shared Jesus with them now, and I've always preached the gospel to people, but there's a level of mission-driven tenacity that I'm having now that it's every single second is an opportunity for hell to lose an opportunity and for heaven to gain an opportunity. And that every single little moment to not take for granted, because it's like the, you know, the, the time with the sand, and once it's flipped over, it's ticking. And the person that you're like, you know, I, I, I even fall victim to this sometimes where I'll be at a store and I'll be like, I'll feel a little tug, like, go minister to that person. I'll be like, well, I'm in a, I'm in a rush, you know, I got to go do something. I got, I got, I'm in a busy guy, you know, I own a business. And, but to realize that, you know, if I don't steward that moment well, does that person get another opportunity? Is there another evangelist coming behind me? Is there another person of God coming behind me? And to really just realize that everybody needs the gospel. And to, what I've learned when I was in Africa is that us in America, we try to use too many words. We try to like secretly come at you like a ninja with the gospel. You know, we're like, we're trying to pre-plan it. We're like, okay, just you're trying to feel them out. And really there's nothing to feel out. God came as a man. He died on a cross. That blood that was shed is precious. We don't need to water it down or make it more creative. The gospel is the gospel. It can be so simple. When you're trying to use a translator in another country, you have to simplify it. But it really, that's all it needs to be. Because it's not us that's doing it. It's not our intellect that is preaching the word in a good way to persuade someone. It's just pure gospel. So I just want to really... Another thing that I learned in Africa is that they're big on the blessing there. They believe when a man of God comes into a city, 
just like in Deuteronomy, that he can bless a city and they will be blessed. So I want to pray right now that we, we have a new revelation of the blessing. Because just because we have so much here in America, we can still have so little of what's valuable. We can throw out things that are so valuable. So I just want to, if everyone could just stand real quick. And we're just going to pray that the Lord blesses us tonight. And that he blesses us with his presence like we've never felt before. Because there's nothing greater than him. Amen? Amen. There is just truly nothing better than to know that we have the king of glory living amongst us and inside of us. That there's nothing else we need that he's already provided for us. We just have to take it. He's already got it ready for us. His hand is out. But we have to take it. We have to love him the way he truly should be loved. You could be sitting in these seats week after week and never even know who he is or the goodness that he has for you or the, the, the plan that he has for your life. You can sit in these seats every single week, but if he doesn't, you don't allow him to touch you, you won't know what it feels like. So as we worship today, I just really want you to, to let it go. Don't worry about the American lens of the gospel. Just look for the true Jesus. The one that died for every single one of us. That one that was beaten, that they couldn't even recognize him. Please don't worry about your comfort. If someone's worshiping a little more eccentric, just know that they have, that is between them and the Lord. And to just give everything to him. We, when we rose our, we, we, we raised our hand that day and said, yes, I want to accept Jesus and follow him. Just know that that's not a one-time thing. We have to continually say yes to Jesus, day in and day out. Pick up your cross daily and follow me, is what he said. So as we worship him, just look at him. Because one glimpse of him will change you for a lifetime. We ha it's gonna take all of eternity to realize who he is. So just please, as we just begin to pray, begin to look at him. Don't look at me. Don't look at man. Don't look at the worship team. Look at Jesus. Holy Spirit, we just, we love you. We ask you to just engulf this place. Begin to touch every single one of us in a new way tonight. Lord, we, we ask you to bless the worship team. Lord, we just ask you to bless the word as it goes forth, Lord. Use Evangelist Joe Termo in a mighty way tonight, Lord. Use him for your glory tonight, Lord. Let us see a new side of you that we've never seen before here at Gold Street Garden, Lord. Just begin to pray in the spirit. Begin to thank him if you can. Just begin to thank the Lord. Come with a heart of thanksgiving tonight. Give him a new yes that he so deserves. Let us honor the presence of the Lord. Let us honor the presence of the Lord. So Lord, I pray right now for every single man and woman and child in this room that we discover a new part of you that we've never seen before. Lord, I just pray that we see heaven come to earth right now. That we don't have to wait. That we know that your hand is out with the blessing that you want to bless us with, Lord. That we just go up and take it and grab it and hold on to you. And that we never let you go, Lord. I pray this right now in your precious name, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. King Jesus, we love you. How can we serve you with the words? We come to see you. See you move. See you move. The Lord Turn his face toward 
times he's come through for you think about all the times God has been so faithful to you it's his blessing on your life he's empowered you to prosper in all your ways you are blessed eternally by the living God to prosper as his son and daughter to reign as kings and priests in this life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Those are his words. We believe your words. We believe your words. We build our life on your word. We come rejoicing and giving thanks according to your word. We come praising in the courts according to your word. We come to worship you in spirit and truth. His favor be upon you for a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor for a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon me. For a thousand generations And my family And my children And their children And their children May His presence go before me And behind me And beside me All around me And within me He is with me He is with me In the morning In the evening In your calling In your glory and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for me. He is for me. May his favor be upon you for a thousand generations. In your family, in your children, in the children, in the children. May his go before you, help guide you, help beside you, all around you. 
Yeah. 
and I is yours. Oh, Jesus Christ is yours. Ooh, healing is yours. El Elyon is yours. El Sinai is yours. His DM, all I am is yours. Oh, all that is blood bought for you. All that is blood bought for you. Do you feel the world is broken? Oh, 
is all creation groaning. It is. Is a new creation coming? It is.
<laughs> you are the only one worthy of worship and song. Oh, we adore you, 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 Jesus. We adore your name. Oh, te adore, Señor. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we are loving in you. We are loving you tonight. We are loving you tonight, Jesus. We are loving you tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. And we fall 
Just say his name over and over again. Everyone. Say all of his names. Emmanuel, Lion of Judah, Jesus, Comforter, Prince of Peace, Mighty Counselor, call him Healer, the Great Physician. Yell his names out. Son of David. The Great I Am. The Resurrected One. The Last Adam. The Bridegroom. The One with eyes of flames of fire. A sword in His mouth. Keep saying His name. Just honor His name. Jesus, Yeshua, the Anointed One, the One who changes everything, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, Jesus, Jesus. singing tonight on the way over I just Exodus 3 was was burning in my heart and you know when when Moses is out he's tending the sheep he's been he's ran away from a conflict in his life and he's been out in the desert for 40 years maybe even thinking he was forgotten or what God had put in his heart but then he sees a burning bush which wasn't abnormal because bushes can burn in the desert but this bush wasn't consumed it was it was something and we know our God's an all-consuming fire but it was when Moses turned it says that when God noticed that he had turned that's when God spoke and Moses begins to walk in as Moses is getting closer God says don't come any closer it says he warned him and he says Take off your sandals, for the ground which you stand is holy. When God was commissioning him to take off his sandals, come in, this is God saying that when you come into my presence, you have to have a willingness to let things of this world go. Because Moses was standing on what man had made, and God said, take it off so you stand on all I have made. When you come into my presence, you know, this is what we've been talking about, the fear of the Lord. When we enter his presence, if you come in with just familiarity and you come in and you're, you're lax and just like, this is just a hangout, you know, it's our approach when we come to him that determines if he keeps speaking or not. Because he warned him saying, take your sandals off and he didn't speak until Moses obeyed the command to take the sandals off to be present. I want you all to know that 
this is a holy moment and you have to say, Lord, right now I have a willingness to lay down anything of this world. I want your voice more than anything. That right now there's hostile thoughts that are in your head. Oh, Jeremiah 17 tells us that the human heart is more deceitful and wicked than anything. I want to make a very strong statement. Your thoughts are horrible. You can't trust how you think. That's why you have to replace your thoughts with his. Because how quick can somebody do one little thing? How quick can somebody do one little thing and you immediately start thinking all the worst things about that person? It's because you're not wired to think holy. That's why he had to put his spirit on the inside of you. And if you trust your way of thinking, you are going down a path of destruction. Isaiah 55 says, just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Just think about that for a moment. Just try to think about that. This ground compared to the sky, how many miles is that? How many feet is that? And we're not even talking about the heavens, the heavens. And he's saying, my thoughts are that much higher than yours, yet you're going to rely how you feel today. Because you had a little off day, that becomes the way that you're going to prescribe your life. Your thoughts are not his thoughts, and he warns you in his word. You have to empty your thoughts. You should wake up every day and say, Lord, I, I submit my wicked way of thinking, and I embrace what the Spirit has to say. It says in Corinthians, it says that no eye has seen nor ear has heard what God has prepared for those he loves. And it says that he's given us his spirit to deposit that. Did you know right now, I was sharing this with Nate, I heard this example and it just blessed me so much. Could you imagine the mother Mary? You know, my wife's pregnant right now. I, I happen to know that. It's a good thing, right? And he's like, we're expecting our third child in October. Can we all just use this as an example? I, I, this blew my mind and it helped me so much. Let's just say Jackie is Mother Mary. And we all know what we know. That, that Jesus is in her womb. How would you treat my wife knowing she was, you would all say, what do you need? Can I fan you? Can, can I make sure everything's okay? Can, do you need water right now? Do you need, what do you need? If, if she even spit on you, you wouldn't care. Because you know that God is on the inside of her. I know that that's crazy. But if you knew, but the Bible says that Christ dwells in us now as brothers, yet we treat each other horribly sometimes. Discord, all these things, but if we had a reverence to understand that God wanted to put his spirit on the inside of us so that he could reveal himself more through one another as we yield to him, as we become one mind in this body of fellowship, we got to stop thinking, letting the world dictate our thoughts, letting people's actions. This has to be it. We have to approach him with reverence, without the fear of the Lord, all you have is fear. The fear of the Lord is being so aware that he is here that I'm not going to be lax in my approach. I'm not going to just treat this as another moment, but this is a holy moment. The King of Kings is in this room. He is on the inside of believers. We need to have a reverence. We need to show this to the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes the Spirit of the Lord just reveals something in a moment. You have to grab it. Because I can talk all I want, but if the Spirit doesn't reveal it to you. This is why Paul says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praying that, that the Spirit of wisdom and revelation would be enlightened to you. Because you can't figure it out. He needs to reveal it to you. 
we have to be watchful and we have to right now saints let's just let's just cry out like but not cry out as the prophets of Baal demanding like God we need you to do something but just like Elijah prayed Elijah didn't have to cry out because he knew his God and all he had to do was say let it let it rain like fire when we cry out in a way that shows that he doesn't hear this is the thing is he hears he is here right now but what we need to do is we need to say like I'm just getting blown away by the gospel again is that okay are you all that we were wretched sinners and Christ is so confident in the work that he did and sending his spirit that God detested us because of our sin yet because of the regenerated work of the Christ he now desires us as a bride what's wrong with us there's there's a work that he did that makes us desirable to be the bride of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords yet we allow our thoughts to think oh it's just it's always gonna be this way I'm always gonna be this way I'm always gonna be less than no we have to believe we have to believe that what he did was final and it was enough can we just can we just thank him that his work is finished can we thank him that he's done something let's receive by faith Thank you for making us a bride. Thank you for making us worthy. Thank you that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We thank you that you're opening our eyes tonight. That, Lord, we surrender sin in this house. Father, we lay down thought patterns that are demonic. Right now, ask the Lord, just as the psalmist said, he said, search my heart. Pray this, saints. Search my heart. Reveal any wicked way in me. These are the prayers. Let God do a work. Let him shine his light on the inside of you. The Lord's going to reveal sexual perversion in the house. The Lord's going to reveal things that you shouldn't be doing. Some of you have been hanging around the wrong people. You've been watching the wrong things. You got to, this is holy. You've become a temple of the Lord. Jesus. We thank you tonight, Lord. Fill us afresh with a revelation of spirit and wisdom. Lord, show us the hope of your calling. <laughs> show us that this love that is beyond heights, depths, width, and length, that surpasses knowledge, that we be filled with the fullness of God tonight. That we would be filled with the fullness of God. Right before we move any forward, I, 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 I just sense in my heart, and I, this is not hype. I said, even with the Spirit of the Lord being here so much, there is a spirit of heaviness that is trying to war against the freedom of Christ in this place. I'm telling you, somebody, cast that garment off. Cast that garment off with your, get rid of it. Tonight there is freedom. There is freedom here tonight. Stir up praise in this place. Praise Him. Joy. Joy in this house. Joy. Joy. I'm telling you, don't just give God a golf clap to, 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 to make me think that you're participating. If you need freedom tonight, He is your freedom. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. It's your responsibility tonight. Let not your heart be troubled. All right, well, it'll, it'll get to some of you later. It's all right. But if, uh, if you can, can you love on somebody? Tell them that Christ is in it.
check, check. Well, I'm so excited for what we have tonight. We got, we got Joe Turnbull and Krista in the house with us. We're so excited. And Nate and Jess are back with us and family, so it's good. Well, how many people are excited to bring a tangible gift to the Lord tonight, to bring something? It's, it, this is so valuable that we, that we understand uh, the Lord was highlighting something to me, and I shared a, a heart school this past week. And in Mark 14, verse 8, it says that the woman that had the alabaster jar that broke it before the Lord, there's this one verse that's so precious that after she had poured this oil upon Jesus right before his burial, her not knowing, but she, she blesses the Lord. In verse 8, it says this, after everybody's accusing her, saying that she's wasted something, and it was her worship from her heart, Jesus defends her. But I love verse 8 because it says, she has done what she could. That should bring so much freedom to us that God is looking, are you doing what you can? You, does anybody hear what I'm saying? That all of us have different schedules, have different things, but God is looking, what are you doing with what you can? Just like the widow with the two mites, she did what she could, and Jesus honored and glorified her. In Leviticus chapter 1, even based off economic stances, that even in this room, if we went around, there's people that make different sums of money and things, but that doesn't make anybody better than the other. In God's eyes, the one thing that you'll see is that in Leviticus 1, when it talked about people bringing offerings to the Lord, that it said that if you're able to bring a bull, bring a bull. If you're able to bring a lamb, bring a lamb. If you're able to bring a turtle dove, bring a turtle dove. So what God was saying, what, whatever is your best, bring that. Bring what you can. Are you thankful that we serve a merciful God and a gracious God that honors us in this way? But if you turn with me to Acts 5, I wanted to start out nice and encouraging. We've been talking about the fear of the Lord as a church, and in Acts chapter 5, I'm going to back up just a few verses. When the apostles found out how valuable could I, is, could I get a testimony of how valuable you believe the gospel is? I, I want to be real. Is the gospel more valuable than your job? Is the gospel more valuable than your family? Is the gospel more valuable than, than vacations? Is the, and are all those things good? Does God give us freely all things to enjoy? Yes, it's beautiful, but... There's something about understanding the value of the gospel. And after Christ rose from the grave, in the book of Acts, you're finding the conviction of that resurrection take root. And the men and women of God saw there was so much value in this gospel that this is what they did in Acts chapter 4, the latter part, verse 32. It says, all the believers, everyone say, all the believers. All the believers. Do you say, do you believe? I do you believe? believe? Yes, I believe it. We're united in heart and mind. This is powerful when we become united. It says they felt that what they owned was not their own. This is what the conviction of the Holy Spirit does. It begins to, to remove all selfishness from you. It, it dethrones self from the throne of your heart. And Jesus takes residence. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. This is biblical. This is something so profound. But then this is what happens in Acts chapter 5. So is that awesome that nobody's telling them to sell everything they have. What are they doing? It's by what? Conviction. This is why you can't force conviction on people. But it's so beautiful. That's where we can get legalistic and force things. But 
when, when we're all one heart and one mind, God begins to speak to us as a body. Have you ever seen that happen even in our body that we'll, we'll share a testimony and somebody's like, God was speaking that to me too. And then all of a sudden we realize that we're, we're hearing the same spirit and we're flowing as a body. But in Acts 5, it says there was a certain man named Ananias who was, who was with his wife, Sapphira, and they sold some property. So what are they doing? They're, they're getting in on it, right? This is awesome. Everybody be like, yes, they're getting it. They're, they're selling property. But then check verse 2 out. It says, he brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. God never required everybody to sell everything they had. This was a conviction of the body, but Ananias and Sapphira wanted to show everybody that they were all in. So they sold their house, but they kept money back. This wasn't, they, it wasn't they were uh, doing something they weren't told to do. They were literally lying to be a hypocrite, to keep face, to act like they're all in, but they're really holding things back. Do you see how this can happen so easy in the church that people can give an expression that they're all in? They can, they can jump, they can dance, they can show symptoms of being all in, but God knows what you're holding back. Now, do you understand this? That this is the word of God. Now, as you keep reading, it says, Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? This is New Testament, by the way. You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified, you don't say. Then, could you imagine a church service? And then some young men got up, wrapped him up in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in and no one gave her a tip, tip off. It says, Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear, everyone say great fear. great fear, gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Verse 12, the apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Coronad, but no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across them as he went by. Crowds came from villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits. And they were, everyone say, all healed. The Lord, by the Spirit of God, had to set a tone that he is not to be messed with. You see, we, we have a lax approach in church that it's like just whatever, whatever. But I'm here to tell you that in the New Testament, God wanted fear to grip the church so that signs and wonders could go forth. So that, that there would be a reverence that God is in this house and we're not going to lie and be hypocritical. I know that this could be a little bit of a harsh word, but I want to see revival in our time. Do you want to see God move? Well, if we want the results from the book of Acts, we got to preach the book of Acts. We got to share from the book of Acts. We got to live like the book of Acts. So I encourage you tonight. God never instructed them all to sell everything they had verbally, but it was a conviction that they all began to have, and other people were just trying to imitate conviction to show face. But God is looking for those 
that are living by the Spirit that say, God, whatever I have is yours. It's not mine. I'm just stewarding in this time. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. We're really excited about what God's doing in our body. We are, we are endeavoring to have Sunday morning services before the end of this year. And everything is trajecting that way. We're believing for twice the amount of resources. We're believing for everything to, to multiply. We're getting ready to sign the papers for the bus that we've been waiting for. And all this stuff that's been on hold, I'm telling you that Moses had to wait 40 years. Other people, it's getting accelerated for us all. So we're excited what God is doing. But I want you all to know that if we see value in the gospel and we see value in what God is doing. I'm telling you, Pinellas, Pasco, Hillsboro, God is doing, do you believe God is doing? Is it people see, are we making this up? This is not a hype show. There's people getting healed on a regular basis. We're seeing salvations. God is moving upon hearts, and we want to show him how much we value what he's doing, amen? So at this time, if you want to get involved with continuing to be a sower in the end time harvest where souls are being prioritized as a thing, the Lord's work. Just raise your hand right now. We'll get offering envelopes into your hand. You also, there's ways to give on the screen. We got text GSG to 727-351-6160. Once again, you just text GSG to 727-351-6160. We also have Venmo or Cash App. Simply, you just do at Gold Street Garden for Venmo or the dollar sign symbol for Cash App with Gold Street Garden. So excited what God's doing. We got so many exciting things on the way. But you know what's the most exciting thing? Is that every day God lives on the inside of us. You know, we got to be watchful that even in church we'll get excited for a new thing coming up, but we, we don't ever want to replace the excitement that we have, that the enemy tries to talk, he tries to water down the excitement. I'm telling you, God lives in us. Like, what, what? Are you kidding me? I'm sorry. I don't know why. So, uh, I wanted, as Nellie, would you, would you come forward real quick? As people are uh, filling this out, Nellie called me uh, in tears and I know this is so holy because she is she never does anything like this and she she called me in tears you know last week when we all flooded the altar before any like during does it was anybody here last, remember that we all flooded the altar she had a vision and when she shared it with me I had such a witness that I wanted her to share share this and it's, it's, it's just a beautiful thing about the unity of the body of Christ. But here, let me hold it for you so that way. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just excited. Ooh, hallelujah. So last week we were intensely praising and worshiping God. And in my spirit, I was... I saw, a, in my vision, I saw someone walking from that door so tall that it, the, the roof of this building was like break in half. I mean, open up as he walked coming to the altar. Everybody was praising and worshiping and crying. And I saw that person or somebody I could not see his face but all I see is he was walking towards the altar he was wearing a garment so white that if he spread it out it could cover the entire church but he kept on walking until here and then he started to wait for people to come so that they could cover them with his garments and then after that Pastor said, in the middle of our worship, Pastor said, he was reminded of the story of the widow, widow or, or the woman who pursued through the, the crowd just to get to the hem of the garment of Jesus. 
And so that immediately leaped in my heart that it was Him who came. And if we come over in the altar, He would cover us all with His garments. So I just want to encourage everybody here that God's presence is here. And if we are willing to submit ourselves under the hem, because I saw the hem of His garment was so wide enough to cover each one. And the good thing is, it represents different colors. That garment has different colors in it. And I look around, I saw different colors, different people here. And so he's not respective of any color because he has it all in his garment. All we have to do is come to the altar and be covered by that garment. And then we can receive our breakthrough. So beautiful. Yeah, when she sh when she was sharing with them me you know, over the phone, I, I began to tremble a little bit because it's there's something we have to we have to be so conscious that when the spirit of the Lord is on something that we live in a day and age where there's so many. I'm just being frank, there's so many weirdos. There's so many people. Uh, I, th I think Pastor Rodney always he calls them Nutrigrain bars. Uh, Nuts, fruits, and flakes. Um, but, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things is just people can get a little off, but when, when you can sense the Spirit of God on, on something, it's a word for the body to bring us to it. Because if we could all see in the Spirit right now, we wouldn't be sitting casually. Right. You have to understand, if you began to see in the Spirit, you would, you would immediately hit the deck, and you would just be like, Lord, I don't know anything. I need to depend on you fully. This is why you gave me your spirit. This is why the Pharisees completely missed Jesus because they were more confident in their own knowledge of God than the spirit of God and the revelation. There's so many people that have spiritual pride. They think they know so much and they're going to miss everything that God has for them. So with that being said, I want to pray over the offering. Father, we just thank you that we have substance to bring to you tonight. We thank you for what you're doing in this house. We thank you for multiplication and increase in every arena, Lord. We thank you that tonight, that when we bring this before you, that it brings a sweet smell to your nostrils. That we don't hold back what you place on our hearts. But we ask you for wisdom to help us to be even more consecrated, even more laid down before you. Give us wisdom to die so that you can be Christ living through us in every arena. Let the fruits of the Spirit grow in our character as we bury our hearts in the soil of the love of Christ. In Jesus' precious name, all God's people yelled, amen. At this time, if you bring your offerings forward to the left and to the right. Also, Kids Church at this point, if Mrs. Jessica in the back, if you, you can be dismi dismissed to the back, door. Can we give it up for our kids that are nation shakers? Loving Jesus. So awesome. So good. As, uh, as people are bringing offerings for, could, could I get Nate, Jess, and Krista? Could you come up? I haven't even given Krista a hug yet. What, what I want to do is, uh, before Joe, we give the floor to the Holy Spirit to move through Joe tonight for us all. I wanted to give the team that went with Joe, obviously, it's, it, it's so precious to know that people even in this body and our sphere are going all over the world, going all over to, to share the gospel because is the gospel valuable. Remember you were saying that before, that means all the ends of the earth, everyone needs to hear it. Jesus says he's not, it, the scriptures say he's not going to come back until it is a justifiable way that everyone has heard the gospel in some shape or form. And that's why beautiful are the feet of those who go and preach the gospel. But I wanted to get them to share their favorite testimony that took place and what was the personal deposit that God did in them inwardly and in their character while they were there. But I just feel free. Go for it. 
Thank you. I know I was back and forth between two, ma'am. But since you just said that, the one that really was personal for me was not even at the crusade. <laughs> it was back at the hotel, oddly enough. Uh, it was in the morning. I was walking and... I, you know, there was like a tea in the hallways, and I'm walking, and one of the hotel staff, she was uh, it's like one of the housekeepers, and she had been walking, and she was just walking. There. I mean, her whole demeanor was just heavy, you know, and I said, hello, my friend, you know, I gave her a hug, and we just were walking. I said, how are you doing? And she, I, I, she didn't even say much. I just said, can I pray for you? And she said, yes, and she started crying, and she pointed to her head. There was a language barrier. I, I, I believe she had a headache, but I believe there was, I don't know for sure, but I think there was something going on mentally. So I laid hands and prayed for her, you know, in Jesus' name. And as I was praying, she just started weeping. And, and I, when I finished, she looked up. I'm not, ex I'm not saying this for the sake of stories. It truly was a completely different person that opened her eyes. And I said, what are you feeling? Tell me. And she said, I feel good. I feel good. She's like jumping. I feel good. And I said, well, what, no pain? What? She's like, I don't know. I feel good. I said, it's not me. It's Jesus. And she said, Jesus. I said, do you want to know him? And she prayed and she received Jesus. And after that, she was running to the front. And everybody she said, she just was jumping. And it was special to me because it was her whole countenance changed. And it reminded me of the verse in the Bible that talks about the aroma of Christ. We are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. And wherever it goes, it lingers like a scent. When we spray in the air, it lingers forever. And that's how she was as she got saved. To the rest of the staff, I felt like she just lingered this, but her entire person changed. And even the next day, you could tell it was just a different person. So that just really stood out to me. And I just prayed to her. Her name was Gladys. <laughs> Yes, the whole time there were so many amazing testimonies. Um, but something before we left the Lord was really just highlighting to me was to have faith like a child. Um, and that's before you enter any situation, just to posture your heart to receive like a child. And um, when you're reading the word, it's, it's a love letter to you and it's from your heavenly father. And so when you read anytime, even as a little girl, if I were to receive a card or a letter from my dad, I knew it was true because it was from my father. And so when you're reading the word of God, you know it's true. You know everything that is in it is true. And so the Bible is still unfolding today. And something that was so special was there was a woman who one night she came, and I think it was the second night, um, and she had been prayed over, and she didn't receive her healing that night. Um, but she came back the next day because she knew that the word of God is true and it remains the same. And so the second night she shared that she had received her healing, that she couldn't even, she couldn't even sweep her home without being in pain. But the second night she came back hungry. She came back ready to receive what the word said. And it was just so special that she had the faith of, the chi of a child, that she knew her, her father's word is true. And that even if she didn't receive it yesterday, she was going to receive it today. And so there's just something so special that when you come to the Lord to have the faith of a child, that you know no matter what he says, it's true and it's going to happen for you. And so it was just so beautiful that she was healed that second day that she came. Amen, amen, amen. It's funny because I had to go, you know, 8,000 miles away to receive this small revelation. Um, but the Lord was really <laughs> showing me about honor. Now, I like, we're in here, and I respect, you know, our leaders here, like, you know, Pastor Dom, Pastor Jackie. I'm full of respect, but I, I really realized that I was lacking in something called honor. And, then, you know, it's funny because Joe and, and Pastor Dom, they're my friends, yes. We've, we've gotten relationships that go deep, but really they, they're the ones that are pouring into me the most. And I, I, I didn't have full honor. It was, but I learned it because I heard the Lord speak to me, honor Joe Turnbull, and I really, at that moment, was so pleased to carry his Bible to the podium. I, you know, walking with him, I was, I began to analyze what, what is everything he's doing because these are the people that came before me. They're the ones that have been walking with the Lord a long time before I have, and they, they've, they've brought me in to this, you know, this, this atmosphere. And I should really honor those moments. And then another thing that was just 
which is awesome, which is a miracle, you know, and, and some people go their whole life, they don't get to see these things, so I'm just so blessed to have seen them, but we had just ended production, and, um, you know, the, we, we were going to the car, and I remember this little boy and his mom, his mom was, like, trying to get us to pray for, me and Jess to pray for this little boy, and I remember bending down and looking at him, and I remember just saying, like, what a beautiful child, like, I mean, this kid was, like, a really good-looking little man, you know, he's probably three or four, but I'm like, I even said, I'm like, Man, you're good looking. You know, he, has, he speaks French. He's got no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> but so we go, begin to pray. His mother, we had a translator, a kid translated for us. And he, his mother told us that it, he couldn't breathe out of his nose. So we go and we start praying. We start praying. We start praying. And I, I you know, I feel the presence of the Lord strongly. And I, I just felt the, the need to keep going and keep going. All of a sudden, his mom looks up and just starts going crazy. Because the, for the first time, his nose, he could breathe out of his nose. He could smell and we just, you know, we erupted with praise, and, you know, it was just an amazing thing, and God moved in a mighty way, and it was just, it's, 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 you can't, you can't unsee these things now. Like, the devil is in trouble. I can't unsee these things. It's true what happened, you know. That's so awesome. Will and Lissette, you, you want announcements for, uh, you got, we're mess, messing the flow up. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I just, um, man, with that, just those testimonies are beautiful. I'm just kind of like shaking. But I know one thing that uh, we were just kind of sharing this past Saturday, um, just having a heart to just going back and using the script to be able to mobilize people to train up and just be able to go out and love people in the framework of just the simplicity of the gospel. Like Nate was saying earlier, how simple is the gospel? And so we have these um, tracks, I mean, these uh, script out in the foyer that you're more than welcome to grab some. And we meet up every Saturday at 11 o'clock. So this past Saturday, we went to the causeway. And uh, it was such a beautiful time because <laughs> the Lord positioned me to talk in Spanish out of my comfort zone. But I was so compelled. I just start speaking and I start just telling them about the Lord while having my daughter on my arms while she's wanting to get snacked. I didn't, I was like, okay, baby, just give me one second. I'm, I want to, and then I'm leading them to Christ. And she was able to get blessed by some food at the same time. I was like, hallelujah, this is so awesome. So we're just so, it was such a precious time that um, I actually want, uh, real quick, um, Kate, Kate, Katie? Katie, Katie, just come down, down real quick um, and just share real quick what, what the Lord did that day. Um, but I just want to, while she's coming down, I do want to honor the man of God and the woman of God. Can we give a hand to Pastor Don, Pastor Jackie? So good. Hallelujah. So good. So what God did on Saturday? Ooh. I can, you're going to hold it? Okay. All right. Because you know I'm going to shake. All right. So this is my first time up here, and I have a couple people from my home church over there. I don't think they've ever heard me talk. But hi, everybody. Happy to be here. So I've been going to the church for a while, like a very, very long time, and I've never actually done an outreach, and this was my first outreach. Not at my home church, I am sorry. But, oh man, it was such a blessing. Of course, being a mom of kids, I woke up late, I showed up late, I texted Lizette, where are you guys? Couldn't find them, parked way far out, <laughs> had to cross the road and then jump over something, and I am short. It was hard. <laughs> it was very hard. Way out of my comfort zone, sweating. I hate the sun. Like, I hate the beach. But I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And it was just such a blessing to be able to watch them, you know, praise God and just approach people, you know, with the gospel with no fear. I mean, there probably was a little bit of fear in there, but... It was just wonderful or wonderful to see them do that. And then um, Lisette, you know, she felt led to talk with a woman who I don't think knew the Lord, but she got to pray over her and I got to watch and I got to see, you know, those thoughts going. You could see that she was really thinking about what she was saying. And then I saw a dog and I had to say hi to the dog, which opened the door for us to be able to pray with another believer. And even though she had already received you know, the Holy Spirit, and she already knew the Father. She needed somebody to pray for her marriage. And that is something that God has put deep in my heart, to pray for marriage. So I felt led to pray for her marriage, you know, and tears started coming down her, her eyes. You could see that she was really being touched by the Holy Spirit. And it was just 
absolutely beautiful. And then you would think it would end there. Like, God's grace is just so big. Um, actually, Will, you know, told me to ride with somebody, which I'm not going to say the name. And on our way, walking back to the car as everybody is leaving, he just told me to ask this person, you know, if there's something that they need prayer for. And the Holy Spirit just fell on us. We're like literally in the parking lot, standing there, praising God as the Holy Spirit's falling on us, like shaking. It was just, just, just a wonderful experience. So show up or show up late. Come on, come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Give a hand to you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, my wife will go ahead and share. Oh, yes. Hi, everybody. So, praise the Lord, there were nine salvations this Saturday. Come on, come on. Thank you, Lord. Um, <laughs> and then I just wanted to share really quick. I know uh, after our back-to-school bash, we do have some backpacks available. If there's any families in the house in need, please see one of us or one of our leaders, and we will be more than happy to bless you, bless your kids um, with one of those. Praise God. I just want to hit these real quick. I messed, I messed our flow up, but that's how we do it. This is, uh, we're just flowing with this one. Who's a new visitor tonight? Is anybody new with us? It's awesome to have you. Could we just, if you, keep, if you keep your hand up, we just, we celebrate you being with us. Let's make them feel real good. Man, it's, it's awesome to have you all. And uh, we just want to, we have a gift for you at the end if you fill that out. And the main reason, we got so many awesome things coming up. We would love to just be able to stay in touch with you in prayer, let you know when uh, things are coming up and so forth. It's good to have family, right? And then this, everybody say this Sunday at 530. And you don't have to repeat me anymore. Is that we're going to do a corporate prayer. Everybody excited about that. We... We come in here and we behold and we contend. We read scriptures over one another and we ask God to give us the spirit of revelation to grow deeper in the knowledge of him. We, we, we come in here and we minister to him. God says he desires to have houses of prayer. Amen. And we need to desire prayer like we desire. There's people that desire conferences. There's people that desire even big outreaches and things. But there's not a lot of people that desire to get in a room and love on Jesus together. Uh, and just just f get lost in his glory and pray. And sometimes even just to come in a prayer room and sit in silence and just let him minister to you. Come this Sunday. It's going to be a beautiful time. Um, we also have uh, child care provided for uh, this Sunday as well. And then we have water baptisms. Everybody excited about that? So there is a, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. You can sign up online to, like, just, you know, go to one of the social media things or email us, let us know. But we do want to get a tentative idea of who's going to get water baptized. It's going to be at 530 the following Sunday, which is the 28th. So just make sure it's always a beautiful time. Together, everyone say September 6th. Michael and Anna Dow will be with us again. And we're super, super excited for that. It's going to be amazing. And... Is there anything I'm forgetting? Oh, the ladies' event is, when is it? The, the 26th. Every, oh, is the ladies excited about that? The, so the ladies' event, the 26th, the, is the location. Is it already on here? What is it? Oh, it's going to be at the IHOP in Tarpon Springs, just like the men's group. We had 25 guys show up to the men's group, and it was beautiful. God. God did such a work, so ladies, you want to be a part of that. It's a time to get vulnerable in, in the word of God and let God do a work. You know, James 5 says that when we confess our sins to one another, that healing comes. And, and when, but it's about getting to the root of things with the word of God coming together and truly breaking bread and loving Jesus. So other than that, what we're going to do right now is I just, I want to hand this over. We've already taken too much time. So this is a dear friend of of ours, how, how long do we, have we known each other now? Seven, eight. Seven, eight years. So, like, I, I, and I met Joe, like, right when he got born again, like, right as he was at a Reinhard Bunky meeting, and him and I crossed paths, like, at the same time while we were doing a college and career ministry back in the day, 
And the Lord had really highlighted evangelism to me at that time again. It was like, and as soon as we crossed paths, all of a sudden we were hitting the streets going out and we would go up to the most motley crews. We would, we would go up in between drug deals in Pasco County and we would preach the gospel. We would love on people. We were so radical. And I'm telling you that just what God has done over the years is just simply phenomenal. But what's going to happen tonight that I want you all to know is that the enemy and just our, the thought life that we have, it, the enemy wants to calm the fire. He wants, to, he wants you to lose your zeal for the things of God. And I'm here tonight to tell you that Joe Turnbull is anointed to be a wrecking ball. And he, come, he, he comes into a place and then he's just going to leave and deal with it, all the carnage will hit in a good way. Because he's called to be an evangelist. And when he, what he's going to share tonight, I want you to receive and be open to the fact that we need to be bolder for the gospel. But it's such an honor to have him with us tonight. We're going to show a video and then he's going to take over. For four years, I want to begin to you to raise your hands. So that's, uh, that's our recent trip we just did to Congo DRC, where we, over 70,000 people heard the gospel, and we had 21,000 decisions for Christ. Yeah. And tonight, I just kind of want to share a little bit about, you kind of like look at these videos, you look at these pictures, you know, and I always used to wonder because I got saved at a Reinhardt Bunky event, and I would see the videos of Legos, the big crowds and everything, I'd be like, man, how does something like that even happen? You're just like, what is that? And, you know, right before I left, I was actually organizing a crusade for America. We're going to start hitting America uh, very soon. Um, the things that you just saw here, uh, the healings, the gospel, the testimonies, we're going to see in Fields of America very soon. And uh, there's more testimonies to be even share about that. But going over there to Congo, there's one thing that I know is every time that I do these crusades directing, you know, what I've learned from Evangelist Daniel Clint is one thing is keep the main thing the main thing. You say, what do you mean by that? It's like the main thing is this, is that if you lift Jesus up, if you lift him up high, if you lift Jesus up, if you lift this gospel up, it will solve all problems in a society. It will solve all problems in a city. It will solve all problems in schools. It will solve all problems with racism. And you're like, Joe, how do you even know that? Because one thing that I know about the gospel and one thing that I know about Jesus is Jesus says this, that if you, if you lift him up, what will he do? He will draw all men unto him. So when we go into a city, we go with one message. Hey, we're here to lift up Jesus in your city, and we ask a question if they're ready.
And the most beautiful thing that you might say, like, man, there's big crowds, there's just awesome testimonies, there's just awesome shots, awesome videos, you know, but the testimonies that you don't hear is that Sunday night when we throw a banquet and we have all the bishops come for the first time and a bishop says up and he says, you know what blesses me more than anything is that there's pastors in this room that have been able to shake their hand for the first time in 40 years in my city that I would have never met. And one thing that I know that the gospel in Jesus does is it unifies. It brings true unity. True unity. And you say, how does something like this happen? It's something supernatural. Because when you go into a city and you lift up Jesus and you lift up the gospel and you keep the main thing the main thing and you bring unity to a city, what people don't understand is that we've been in Congo since last December where we went into the country because God told me Congo, and I sent a young man, and his name is Harrison, and he drove from city to city, and he prayed over each city, and he met with pastors to see one thing. Will they unify, and are they hungry? And he picked the city of Kowazi because guess what? He saw that there would be unity. And my Bible says in Psalms 133 that when, you know, there's unity, how pleasant it is to the Lord. And guess what he does? He commands a blessing. And you know what the blessing is today? The harvest. The blessing isn't filling your bank account. The blessing isn't in a new job, a new promotion. The blessing isn't a new car. The blessing isn't your family getting everything they need, the next scholarship, the next this, the next that. The blessing is souls coming to the kingdom in your city. The blessing is when he puts his, his gospel, a city on a hill that can be seen from all over. You're like, Joe, man, how? 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 We go in with the message of Jesus and we keep lifting him up. We keep lifting him up. And when you lift him up, unity happens. He, dr he draws all men and we see revival in cities. And like I said, just recently I've been in, uh, I've been in America and I've been meeting with pastors. I've been in Virginia and um, I'm so excited for that up in October. And I've been talking to a, uh, Pastor Dominic about creating a team, you know, Gold Street Garden team that can come out to these missions. You know, Nate and Jess were the first ones. It was kind of like a trial basis, but there's going to be opportunities for you guys to sign up on trips to go to things. You know, one of the things that's coming up is in America, when I sit down with these pastors in America, and, you know, I show them these videos and they ask, like, man, how does something like that happen? I say unity. And they're like, man, do you think God can unify in our city? In America with different denominations and different things? I said, all I know is one thing, is that if we just keep lifting up Jesus and we keep the main thing the main thing, Jesus will automatically unify any situation. He'll bring reconciliation between every problem. He'll, bring, he'll solve racism problems because with the place that we were in, I go into the city, and for the last four years, guess what they've been doing for ministry is reconciliation between, to, between races. It's a real thing. It's a real problem that's been happening. You know, you see riots over the past years, and you're like, man, Joe, this is a pretty hard subject to talk about. But I'm telling you what, they were after the wrong thing. They were trying to solve the problem of racism when the only thing you can do is lift up Jesus, and Jesus draws all men, and reconciliation naturally happens. Because the gospel is the cure, the gospel is the answer, and Jesus is the answer. That's it. And literally, we sat down, I sat down with all these pastors, you know, I was in Williamsburg, I was in Jamestown, and if you don't know about Jamestown, Jamestown is the first city that s slaves came over from Africa. That's where, they were, that's, that's where they were sold. So this is a big thing in this town. They think it's a big stronghold, and they think, man, do you think that these African-American churches, you know, and these Spanish churches, and these white predominant churches, you think they'll work together? And then I sat down with them and they said, man, have you ever experienced racism dealing with, you know, crusades in Africa to cause a unity? And I'm just like, no, I really haven't. I said, everybody's there, same race. <laughs> I'm the only guy there that's different. But then it hit me and I said, but you know what they do have? I said, they have tribalism. I said, we're different sections. They will rule and reign over different people. And I'll tell you one thing, it doesn't matter the, the people, what people want to do is they are greedy, they want to rule, they want to reign, they want power, and they'll use anything to do it. Whether it's a different tribe, a different area, a different culture, a different skin color, a different economic background, it doesn't matter what it is, that is the nature of the flesh. And they're like, whoa. 
And I said, what, I said, what we really need to do is we need to start focusing on building the kingdom and preaching the gospel to the lost. And I promise you all these problems will solve itself on the side. They're like, are you going to address this in our city? I said, there's one thing that I'll address, and that's the gospel. I said, I'm an evangelist. I'm here to train. I'm here to equip. I'm here to lift Jesus up in the city, and I'm here to see transformation. And there was one man in this city, in this town, right here, right here in America, and uh, his name was uh, Pastor Ellis, and he was over uh, the Tri-County Baptist Association. It was an association of about 18 African-American churches, you know, and he was just like, he came up to me, he's like, I really love what you're about. Our church needs to really get an evangelism, and we need to go save and seek that which is lost. And I'm sitting there, I was like, this guy has no idea because I am a full charismatic, on-fire believer, and he just invited me into his house. I was like, this guy has no idea what he got himself into. I said, but man, I said, what? I said, what a first step to be able to cross over denominations lines, to cross over racial lines, you know, to break this spirit that is over this land. I said, man, I said, God, what an opportunity. I said, you know, this is going to be amazing. It was only a church of 70 people. You know, we go to the church. You know, I get up there. You know, we pray. We, you know, we pray for the spirit to fill people, people with boldness. We take the church out, and we're taking the church out to evangelize door to door on a Sunday. We just took them right out after service. We didn't even care. You know, we're like, we're going out. And they saw five people get healed. They saw two people get saved. And they're out there, and they're winning the loss, and people are getting excited. But the pastor, here's the kicker. Me and the pastor had a meeting during church service because there was one lady that I befriended when I was there, and she was a part of the team. She's this old lady, this little old lady. And I, I said, hey, you know, you want to go to Pastor Ellis' church with us on Sunday? And she goes, no, I can't. I said, what do you mean? She goes, 21 years ago, I was helping Pastor Ellis's mom. She had a little shop. And she was giving away shirts, she was giving away pants, you know, they were giving away food, and she's, I would help her every week. But then one day, the shipyard in Virginia went on strike because of unfair wages. And this lady's husband was a big man in charge in the shipyard, and when she was serving with Miss Ellis at the, at the, at the house, at the place, some men came in, and Miss Ellis was like, you got to get in the back. i got to protect you. you got to get in the back. There's going to be a problem. So the old lady, she goes in the back, and then she scoots out the side, but she goes home, and she tells her husband, and guess what? Her husband is irate. Her husband is mad. Like, who are these people to, you know, put my wife in fear? Well, there was an agreement made between the two the week before that these people were going to donate money to buy laptops for all the little children, the under, underprivileged children. And the husband decided not to give the money. And the old lady was never allowed back there to serve with Miss Ellis. You're talking real problems. You're talking lines divided. Economically, racially, problems, hurt, pain, offense, depression, anger, unforgiveness. You're talking about real things. And this little old lady, she said, I can't go there. And I said, you can't. The next day, she calls me and she says, I must go with you and I must ask Pastor Ellis for forgiveness. So we go to the church and we're sitting down and Miss Ellis, she just died six months ago. And we go to the back room and I'm sitting down and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing there. I'm just like, I'm just this kid from Newport Richie. I said, this is crazy. You know, I was like, I was like, I just got off drugs seven years, you know, eight years ago. I was like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm supposed to be going to Congo. I was like, this is crazy. I was like, I don't know what this guy's going to say. I don't know what she's going to say. I was like, I've never been in any, any reconciliation meetings. You know, I said, the only reconciliation I've been in is like lawyers and judges, and they're to like telling me to go to jail or something. You know, but I'm just sitting there, and I'm just like sitting there, and she goes explaining. She's like, first of all, Mr. Ellis, I just want to apologize. My name is da 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 da. And she goes, you know, I want to tell you something that happened 21 years ago with your mom, and we weren't able to give her the computers that you desired. And she asked the man for forgiveness, and the man looked at her and said, ma'am, you have nothing to worry on behalf of my family. We forgive you. And then the woman reached in her purse, and she broke out her checkbook, and she wrote a $20,000 check for that man right there. Here's the thing. That man never knew 
That man never knew that this lady was going to come. Never knew that we were associated. Didn't know anything about the story. All he said is, my church needs to preach the gospel, and we need to lift Jesus up in this city, and it will solve these problems. And God brought a reward because guess what? Where there's unity, he pours out a blessing. You want to know why your home's not getting blessed? It's because you're fighting and arguing with your spouse and your children, and there ain't unity in your house. And you're wondering why, man, God, where's my blessing? Where's my help? Guess what? Why don't you start acting in forgiveness, man? Why don't you start getting real with your spouse and start sitting down and talking about real issues? All because we went into this town and we said, hey, we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. That's what the gospel does. This ain't some like American gospel in an American church and just some weak gospel that, man, we're just, you know, we're going to preach this thing and people's, they're going to come and be a part of our church and they're going to become a part of a nice family. We're going to have great community and we're going to do life together. <laughs> oh, praise God, here we go. <laughs> because let me tell you something, what it takes to do something like that. It will rip your insides out. It will take you for a turn, a loop. When you want to see revival in a city, it will take everything you got. You can't just work 40 hours, 60 hours a week, tip God and, you know, praise a worship song and think God's going to change something because you gave a little bit. Or you went and served for four hours at a church and you just think, man, God's really going to do something. He wants everything that you have inside of you to see something magnificent happen on the outside. He wants to see the true gospel of Christ invade streets, invade cities, invade lands. You know, we can go into a place like, we can go into an America event. We can put out a lot of money in promo. We can hire awesome bands, man. We can draw a crowd. But let me tell you something about Christ for All Nations that I've learned. That we go in early and we dig up fallow ground. We dig a deep well of something, a revival of prayer. We've had prayer meetings after prayer meetings after prayer meetings. People crying out, digging up land, you know, sitting down with pastors, challenging them to reach out to people in their city that they haven't worked with in years. If your pastor doesn't have relationships with other pastors in the community, is the gospel flourishing in your church? Are you seeing revival? Is there unity? This is the kind of gospel that I'm talking about. It's not a weak gospel. It's not a gospel that says, hey, come be part of our family. Let's do community. Let's do life together. Let's get th through this thing together. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what Jesus said. You want to know what Jesus said about family? I want to read this to you real quick. These are the words of Jesus, not the words of Joe Turnbull. Praise God that the word preaches better than I preach. And people need to start preaching the word. You start preaching the word, you start preaching the gospel, something's going to change. You don't have a choice. It doesn't return void. Just like that testimony you heard, that lady knew she was going to get healed, and she fought, and she contended, and she fought for it. She didn't give up. This is, what the, this is what the Bible says about family, Matthew 10, 37, and 38. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Man, do I miss my children when I'm out there? Yeah. Do I hate it when the enemy comes and attacks and they start to get sick when I'm on the field? Yeah. Yeah. But when I drive to that field and I see those people out there crying out for their city and that they need a touch, they need a healing, they need a savior, they need change. That's when the gospel's magnified. When I have to get on a plane and I can't even go home and see them because when I fly in I have to go straight to Virginia to deal with pastor's drama. And it's not like, it's not even a complaint, it's like a joy to do, it's crazy, I can't even explain it. It's like, it's, like, I, it's like a paradox. I, I can't even comprehend it. That's how you know when it's God is when you can't comprehend something. You're like, man, this doesn't even make sense. <laughs> I was like, all these people are getting saved. All these people are getting healed. And my little daughter's at home and she's sick and she's hurting. 
but I'm thankful that I have wonderful in-laws that have my, you know, that have our families back, and we do this as a team. I'm glad that I have church people. I'm glad that I have people praying. I'm glad that, you know, three weeks from the crusade when I'm, I'm, I'm coming up short, you know, I get, a, I get a message from Dom saying, I got you, and he sows a seed, and it pushes it through. Somebody who's building the kingdom who doesn't even care, it's, just, it's, it's not even going to affect Clearwater. But he's not building his kingdom. He's building the kingdom of God. He's blessing pastors. He's blessing people. He's blessing things. Man, this is a man of God who really loves unity, who loves working with people, who will go out on, you know, Sunday and team up with Tampa and go out there and be like, man, we're here together. Who has people come in his church? He shares his pulpit. He's not trying to magnify himself. He's not trying to magnify his institution. He's not trying to, like, you know, use his pulpit as manipulation to raise people up. He's just saying, hey, man, what God says goes in this house. He's not worried about a time frame when I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't have to keep looking at the clock because guess what? We're free. <laughs> Jesus is going to move. If you're sitting there looking at your clock, I'm sorry, man. You're looking at the wrong thing. The gospel hasn't cost you anything. That's why you're looking at your clock because you don't understand the price that it pays and it takes. But if you understood the reward after it, man, you'd be like, man, I want to give my time. I don't even care what it takes. That's the gospel. This is Jesus. This is him lifted high. This is something that is so special, something that's so close to your heart, something that saved you from the depths of hell. And if you can't preach and you can't live from that, guess what? You'll never experience it. And you'll just be coming to church because you want to be part of a family, because you don't want to be alone anymore, and you want to have community. Listen, man, he didn't call us to have a country club. I had friends before I came to church, man. I never had a problem with that. I had the wrong friends. We won't even get into that. That would be a whole other story. <laughs> Some of them know me here. You know, they, they know what it was about. <laughs> Community. We hear this term a lot thrown around in church right now to make people feel good when they come in. Be a part of community. Feel wanted. You're not, you're not alone. Community. Acts 2.42. I mean, I love when Dom touched on a lot of this during, you know, offering prayer, whatever, whatever you call that. <laughs> It ain't normal, but I love it. <laughs> Community, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. 43, a sense of awe came over everyone, and the apostles performed many signs and wonders. Let me tell you something. If you're a part of a church community and they're not going out seeing signs and wonders, guess what? That's not biblical community. Because community in the Bible is they broke bread and they fellowship. What were they fellowshipping about? They were fellowshipping the fact that they were going out, preaching the gospel, getting persecuted, going through hell, and they wanted to come back together to make sure that they weren't alone, that they would go out, that they would fight the good fight of faith. That's the community that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a community that bakes you a cake on your birthday so you feel good. I'm not talking about a community that like, man, I really love my neighbor. I went to my neighbor's house down the road that goes to my church and I brought him some food. What about the neighbor that irritates you every single day because they don't know Jesus? What about the neighbor that you, you, you smell them smoking pot nonstop because they have serious depression, they can't get through nothing? You know, what about that neighbor? What about that community? The gospel can change a community if it lives from a community perspective of the Bible. In Acts 4, when they fellowship, they broke bread. Guess what? The fear of the Lord came over them. They weren't filled up with giggly joy and like, man, we're living a good life. We're blessed. All these people got all the problems. You know, we got, a good, we got good friendships. Shoot, my brother, my, you know, I can't say that. <laughs> I can't say that. I can't say that. I know people, man, they have great community, man. They go to football games, drink beer, and they have a good time. And they love each other more than people in the body of Christ love each other. But the community I'm talking about is when two people say yes to go on with you a trip. And problem after problem is coming and they're just whispering in your ear and they're just encouraging you. And you're like, man, this, that. They're just like, man, I'm just so glad to be here. I can't believe all these people. And I'm like, man, more people better show up. <laughs> I was like, we got expectations here. <laughs> Everybody, they're just like, whoa, this is crazy. I'm like, yo, it's not that crazy. Something's wrong here, you know. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. 
because stuff does go wrong. And, like, after you go through it a couple seasons, you realize trends like, hey, something's not right here. But the first night, you know, we were driving to the crusade, and we have military police escorts. You know, we're wisdom, we use safety. There's a lot going on. There's a lot happening. But as we were driving down the road, and the police were had the sirens on, and they were going to the crusade field, all of a sudden when we're driving by, I see groups of people running from us, like in fear. And I'm like, usually they're running towards us, like really excited about what's happening. I'm like, man. This is crazy. And when I first got to Congo, my director, Harrison, he's like, look, Joe, he goes, you know, there's been trouble here the last two, three weeks. And I said, what's going on? He goes, you know, and we'll probably have to take this down from the recording. I'll tell you later. Um, He says, the military and police are going around and they're snatching up all the young men and they're sending them to war. So what that means is a 20-year-old boy who's walking home from going to college, minding his own business, going home, just walking down the street, they can come by and just, whoop, I'm sending you over to East Congo and putting a gun in your hand and you have to fight or guess what? You'll never see home again. So in the midst of a draft, not like a draft like we have where people get a letter in the mail and they can cry and they can kiss their family and they can say goodbye and they can protest and get locked up and, you know, power to the people and all that stuff. No, I'm talking about a real draft where people are getting snatched off the streets, put right into war. And I'm like, man, this is not good. Because what we do is crusades and this is an open field setting where, you know, everyone can come and hear the gospel. You know, and I said to Harrison, I was just like, what do we got to do? And uh, we were able to talk to the police chief. We were able, we were able to bless him, you know. <laughs> if you've been in the third world country, you know what I'm talking about. You know, we'd be blessing people left and right to make things happen. It's just the way things are. It's the culture. It's okay. It's, it's you know, nothing in the Bible, you know, says to bless people. So praise God. But I think it was the second night. I don't know if it was the second night, third night. I can't, I can't even remember. Everything's just kind of a blur. Uh, you know, I got up on the platform, you know, and I, you know, was, I got permission from the police to say that anyone who comes on this field, that this is safe, or this is a safe field, this is God's land. And then he saw it double. And then he saw it triple. And then when we prayed the blessing over the country the last night, you got to really pray, and you got to pray for the boys to come home. You got to pray peace over the land. And, you know, people, boy, young men could come to that field and experience the gospel, the power of God, the freedom that's in Christ and the safety you know, that, you know, Christ can provide in a field. And, you know, those are just the little obstacles that we run through, and we run through them all the time. You know, this is the things that we do, the the tough roads that we walk, you know, and people see, like, the glamour shots, and they see you preaching on stage, and they see people shining the lights, and you're like, ah. But the challenge is, you know, it's, it's the true gospel that we preach, and, uh, it's a blessing to be able to do it, but at the same time, it will cost you everything. And, uh, you know, there's so many different people and different aspects and different things and perspectives of the gospel. And what I want is to keep always the main thing, the main thing, and to live from this gospel from a pure perspective, from a pure thing, and for it to rip the insides out of you. And, you know, cost you everything because guess what? You know, we read in 2 Corinthians 4 that, you know, death in me means life in them. You know, when Jesus says, like, you want to have life and have life abundantly, that means you're going to experience some death in you to that flesh. You're not going to be able to do everything you want to do. You're not going to be able to experience everything that you want to experience. You're going to miss things that you didn't want to miss, you know, if it, if you have a choice where on a Saturday where it's like, man, I can go hang out with my friends, I'm going to go out on the boat, man, I'm going to go have a good time, I'm going to play this game, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, you know, but I'm just going to give a little bit more to God on the offering plate, we're going to be cool, you know, and we're going to pray, you know, and I can, you know, move my schedule around to fit the church's schedule, and we're going to get all these schedules right so I can do what I want to do, and I can still do my church thing. 
that's the main reason why you don't see the gospel transforming communities. That's the main reason why you don't see the gospel transforming homes. It's between marriages. It's when, you know, you won't lay down your desires to uplift your spouses. When you don't want to lay down your desires to, you know, lift up your kids. When you won't experience the gospel in a community where it's, you know, it's not okay. Like, you know, we rejoice, you know, for the, the, for the one and for, you know, leaving the 99 for the one. But, it, you know, if someone asked me a question, I, you know, we just started a boot camp back up in Orlando. And I'm interning these young guys and discipling them. And they said, Joe, Joe, what does it feel like to come back and, you know, do one-on-one evangelism after preaching to 40,000 people and seeing 8,000 people give their Lord to the life, you know, which one is better? Which one makes you feel more excited? You know, and it was like almost like a trick question. <laughs> it's like, you know, I could say a lot of different things. I said, but then the Lord spoke to me. I said, you know, learning what I've learned and doing what I know is that one-to-one evangelism will always lead to something greater in a city. And what I mean by that is there's people in this house that have, you know, have great vision and great thing. You know, you need to really seek the Lord and how to make increase happen in your backyard. How to expand your tent. You know, how to lay it all down. How to really go after it, man, because there's people out there perishing. And you need to, you know, we need to stop preaching the gospel for ourselves. But start preaching the gospel for people. You know, it's the light of the gospel. And thank God for the mercy of Christ. I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, I, I like to share stories. I like to talk. But I really want to read from the word of God. And I really want to um, let him speak to you through this. Uh, you know, I, I really love this part. 2 Corinthians 4, they, they, they title this chapter, The Light of the Gospel. And I'll, I'll tell you, I just read this yesterday with my wife. And literally, as we were leaving Congo, we were on the airplane. I look at my wife and I say, I said, sweetie. I said, for the next two weeks, it's probably going to be the hardest two weeks of our life. I said, you need to buckle down because guess what just happened? We just went into a city and we just wreaked havoc on the darkness. I said, it's coming. I said, we need to buckle down. I said, we're going for a ride. And this morning when we woke up, you know, because the best thing that you can run to, you know, in a time like that is the word of God. He's our strong tower. He's our refuge. You know, and this is a marriage, you know, and we have to stay strong. You know, men, you need to read the Bible with your wives. Because if the enemy can't get you, he's going to get her. If he, can't get, if he can't get you as a couple, he's going to go after your kids. And this is what God brought me to. This is after, and it's the light of the gospel, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. It says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let let." Let light shine out of darkness. He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 What God is saying is that he's the only one who can bring light to the darkness. My favorite, my favorite verse that really stood out to me in this passage is verse number 5. And it says this. It says, for what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with, our, with ourselves as servants. There's so many people today, guess what they're doing? They're preaching the gospel for themselves. They're building their personalities around the gospel, and they're marketing, and they're acting like the prophets of Balaam, and they're selling their giftings, they're selling their talent, and they're selling the gospel for a cheap price, and it's no gospel at all. 
It's churches that are built around personality instead of the work done on the cross. And when you see that minister fall, guess what? The whole church is dismantled. Let me ask you something. Is that church built on the foundation, on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ? Or is it built around a man? It's not about for ourselves. It's not about building a following on social media and preaching in churches and building an audience so you can be in full-time ministry and you can be blessed and you can buy nice cars and you can ride around on your boat and you can put on a show and you can do this whole emotional experience. That's not the gospel that I preach. That's not the gospel I live. That's not the gospel I want. The church is the last place I want to preach. Why? Because I'm an evangelist and I understand the work that is needed on the outside of the world. There's a dying place. There's cities that are in siege in war zones. And guess what? We have the opportunity of a lifetime to run up in that thing. That's it. People want to preach for honorariums instead of saving souls. I'm not an itinerant speaker. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm a blood blot evangelist that was saved by the gospel of Christ. And I'll do everything in this world for people to hear it. I'd rather be training and equipping and seeing people get lost and saved in a community. I'd rather be sitting down with pastors strategizing and organizing how to save their city. It took four months, four months of a man named Harrison. I want to put up that picture real quick. This is probably the greatest testimony of all time. It's what we call staying in our lane, preaching from the gospel. It's a pic- the picture of the two. And this is uh, Pastor Harrison. This guy, he's 32 years old. <laughs> I'm 34 now. My birthday was just uh, last week or something like that. I don't even know what day it is sometimes. That's what happens when you start living for eternity. This man, Harrison, right here, he's, he's 32 years old. I met him in Tanzania, and for a whole year, he served by my side from crusade to crusade, and he learned, and he got discipled. You know, many people think discipleship is sitting around a circle and teaching character, and that's a great aspect of it. But if you're not imparting into someone and leading them into their calling and, you know, advancing the kingdom of God, you need to really check what discipleship means in the Bible because Jesus took his disciples and they went preaching the kingdom. That's discipleship in community with family. That's the kind of family I want. And this is my brother right here. He's 32 years old. Like I said, for a whole year he followed me and he said, Joe, this is what I want to do. And he said, I said, what do you need? He goes, I need a car. So we were able to purchase a car. He left his church. He put his wife, his three-year-old, his two-year-old in the car, and he drove across Africa to Congo. Never did a crusade before on his own. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> and this is what he, that's what he told me the last day of the crusade. He said, I was crazy. I said, you're crazy. And uh, he went into Congo, and for four months he organized, and he, he, you know, everything that we taught, everything that we learned, he executed to a T. And this man of God, this disciple of Jesus Christ who lays everything down, who laid his family down, laid his comfort level down, went into a country. He doesn't speak the language. Everybody spoke French. You talk about weird, man, African speaking. It was just weird French. It was just wild. And so he's in the country, and this man organized this crusade, and he has just as much a reward, and he, he helped organize something that led 21,000 people to Jesus. And through every trial and every pain when you preach this gospel and you do these great exploits and you're pouring out your soul and you're pouring out your life, man, and you see this great thing and you're like, the reward's great. Guess what? Something's coming. And it hurts and it molds you and it makes you who you are. And when me and my wife were sitting down, was it today or yesterday? It was yesterday. It's just pressure all around. And then I read verse 7 and verse 8. We'll finish with verse 9. It says, this is 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. 
persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Verse 12, so death is at work in us but life in you. That is the gospel. It perplexes you. It makes you feel like you don't know what's going on. That you don't understand. You're in the will of God and you're like, I can't comprehend what's happening. I don't know which way to go. I don't know what's next. You feel struck down. When you get off the airplane, man, they're checking your bag. Security, you don't know what's happening. You know, you're getting phone calls back from home. You know, the company's falling apart. This man's having a problem. That man's having a problem. And everything's coming out against you. Guess what? You're getting struck down. But you're not destroyed. But you're not destroyed. But you're not destroyed. And I'm not talking getting struck down because you've been living in sin and disobedience. I'm talking about when you step in the will of the Father and you're going out there and you're taking the territory and you're pressing against the kingdom. Guess what? That is what happens. That's what happens. You'll be in places of despair. You'll be in places of perplexity. You know, and these people want to preach this gospel that, man, when you get saved, you're going to be blessed. It's going to be good. You're going to get a family around you. You're going to have community. You're going to be rocking. You're going to have favor. You're going to get promotion. And, yes, all that happens. But with those highs also comes those lows. And that low is you and your flesh getting killed because you're not used to it. That's the real issue is because you've never hung on a cross and you saw your flesh. You've never been beaten. You've never been wounded. What for Christ's sake? What to know him in his sufferings. It's the sufferings that we know that we partake in that what? That exploits life to the world. You want to see miracles. You want to see signs. You want to see wonders. You want to do great gospel exploits. You want to see revival in your city. It takes more than praying on a Sunday. It's praying every day. It's being the light of the world at your job, with your family. It's living a life of Christ with character, integrity, honor, laying yourself down, putting interests of others above yourself. Because it's not about you preaching. It's not about you being on a platform. It's not about you being used by God. I got a gospel truck. It's been used probably 16, 17 times. I preached on it three times. I wasn't even the first one that used it. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying this is how the kingdom works. You know, you want to go to Bible college, you want to be put on a platform, you want to do mighty things, you're like, man, I'm a man of God. No, you got to die. You got to die. You got to be afflicted. You got to, man, you got to take those sufferings with Christ. You're under pressure. You're feeling everything, man. Every day I wake up, and the more and more that I get closer, and I feel like I'm stepping in this will of God, and it's more, and I'm like, man, I'm really doing a lot. I'm really giving a lot. He says, there's more. There's more. There's more. That little thing you're holding on to, I need to take it. Where you want to live, what you want to do, I want to take it. The last place I wanted to be was in America because I know how much easier it is over there to go in and just, man. But this is where I am. This is the next step is that we're going to see cities across America and fields filled with people. And you say, Joe, how's it going to happen? Unity. Unity. Just a few weeks ago, we did an all-corporate evangelism outreach where we had Anglican church show up. We had a Baptist church show up, Pentecostal church show up, non-denominational church show up. Any type of church you think of, people all came to that place. And guess what? We did an evangelism training, and we sent people out into the city, and they saw people get saved. You ever seen a 71-year-old Anglican man get up and give a testimony for the first time, him going out and leading someone to Jesus? Praise God. It's crazy. And we're going to see something. Why? Not because of Christ for all nations are great or, you know, this person's great or that person's great or this personality or that personality and this ministry and, man, we can do this and we can do that. No, it's because there's one man named Evangelist Ryan Hart Bunky who lifted up the name of Jesus. Who preached Jesus on his stone, on his tombstone. It says he preached Jesus. The man who saw 79 million decisions for Christ, who rocked a continent and said with his last words in his last years, America shall be saved. But it's time to stop playing games. 
It's time to stop doing just the basics, just the routine, just the sacrifice that you've been doing. You know, it's time to serve more, it's time to work more, it's time to give more. And you're like, man, there it goes with that giving. Listen, God doesn't need your money. He'll get it from somewhere else, I promise you that. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. He don't need it. He don't need you to get his will done. The stones will cry out. I'm telling you, he will take anyone. He'll take a boy from Newport Ritchie strung out on drugs and put him on platforms to preach the gospel to the world. And it's not because of who I am. It's just because guess what? You say yes. That's it. That's all it takes is to say yes. He doesn't need talented people, good speakers. He needs people that preach Jesus. He needs people that preach the gospel. And you say, Joe, man, how do you not get worn out? How do you not get tired? There's only one thing that keeps the light of the gospel going forth in me to bring out the darkness, and that's what? The fire of God. And I'm not talking about fake fire. I'm talking about a real fire in my bones. That when I'm broken, that when I'm despair, that when I'm perplexed, I'm on my way back to the away from America, and I was like, man, God, everything's falling apart. I close my eyes, and I feel the warmth of the fire and its presence, and that fire that gives me peace, that fire that calms me, that fire that says everything is going to be okay. It's not some emotional fire that I, I feel and I need to shake, and that's all good, and I do that too, but it's this fire that keeps me going that I'm like, man, if I close my eyes, I know he's with me, and there's no darkness because the fire of God rests in my soul. It's because one day when I was at Calvary Chapel Worship Center, I'm walking to the back and a man named Marcus Carter says, do you want everything God has to offer you? I'm like, man, I thought I already had it. You know, I'm saved. You know, I'm feeling great. And he lays hands and people lay hands on me and I get prayed and then all of a sudden I see fire from the sky and it comes down. I'm not trying to be all weird, man. You people know me. Like, I'm not weird like that. I don't even like to talk like that. And the fire comes down, man, and it touches me and all I see is just these black spirits flying off me. And then ever since then, it was easier to preach the gospel. It was easier to live holy. It wasn't about the do's and don'ts of Christianity. It was that, man, there was a man who loved me, who spiritually touched me with this fire, who burned every iniquity, every heavy weight off of me. And he did that so he could burn the heavy weight of sin off of me so I could run a race. And that's what this baptism of the Holy Spirit is about. It's about running a race and being filled with power. You see, it's not a reward. It's not something that you attain, that you have, that you're like, man, I've been reading my Bible. I've been praying. I've been worshiping. God, you have to give me a fresh touch. I've been doing everything right. No, when you run a race and you win, a reward is a prize. But you need power before the race. That's why God makes it a gift. Where's the keys at? Where's the keys at? The piano keys. That's what the gospel does. The gospel saves, he sanctifies, he seals you to the day of redemption. And if you are saved, if you are blood bought, if you are a Christian, guess what? You have the whole Holy Spirit in you. There's not a second act of grace. There's nothing like that. The day you get saved, guess what? It says you are what? Sealed to the day of redemption. Now what God wants to do is he wants to fill you with what? His power. His power. You're sealed to the day of redemption. But you have to be sealed to feel that power of Christ. Everyone's eyes closed just for a moment. Because we might have heard a different gospel that you've never heard tonight. You might have heard the gospel of Christ, that Jesus Christ, he lived a perfect life, that he died on a cross, that he was buried three days, and that he rose again so that he could take the sins away of the world. He died so that you could die with him so that you may have life and life abundantly. That's the blood of Jesus and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. That is what is preached. It's not sermons that save it's not songs that save. It's the blood of Jesus that saves. And tonight the blood of Jesus is here. There's someone that's been on the fence that you've been really wondering, what is this thing really about? I'm here to tell you tonight that you just found out. And Jesus is here 
He wants to come into your heart and he wants to seal you to the day of redemption. And you can leave this building and you can know that you know that you know that you know where you're going to go. Let me tell you something. If you believe that you're saved, guess what? You'll always be saved. It's time to start believing tonight. If that's you tonight and you want to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want you to raise your hand. Hallelujah, I see hands, I see hands, I see hands. Jesus is here tonight. This is your night, this is it. It's over after this. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. They, some people use this Christian saying that it's not, it's not the prayer that, you know, it's not the prayer that saves you. And I understand what they're saying, but guess what? My Bible says anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm glad I said that prayer. So if you want to pray with me. Just say, dear Jesus, I ask you for forgiveness of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you Lord of my life. Be my father. Be my friend. I thank you, Jesus. Now this second one is people that want to get filled with the real fire of God. A fire that will keep you burning, that will keep your torch aflame, that will lift heavy burdens, that it will heal sickness, that will heal disease. I'm talking about the refiner's fire of God that burns every iniquity, every heavy weight, that it is what it is, the anointing that breaks the yoke, that's the true fire of God that gives you endurance, that gives you perseverance. You can't get burned by hell's fire if you're on fire with his fire. If that's you tonight and you want to get filled with the Holy Spirit and the fire of God, I want you to come up to the altar. There's people's flames that have been out. There's people's lamps that are halfway full. There's people's lamps that are empty, and God knows your heart that you've been emptying them out. But he has a fresh feeling for you tonight. Those who pour out get poured into. Jesus. Jesus. And I will, I will pray for people, but what I want to do is if that's you tonight, I just, just, just stand to your feet real quick. God knows your heart. You bowed down. You prayed. But it's time to receive. It's time to receive. You see, a good father lets you look at him in his eyes. So just with your head facing up towards him, he wants to give you a gift tonight. And what's going to happen is that we're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to come and fill you, and you're going to feel just a fire in your stomach. Some of you are already feeling that fire right now. What I want you to do is I want you to yield to that fire. I want you to yield to him, yield to his presence, yield to the spirit. I don't need you to work something up in your head. I need you to receive something deep down in your spirit. And I just want you to pray with me because it's your prayers it's you asking your father for a gift. And what good father would withhold a gift from their son or daughter? So with your eyes closed and focus on Jesus. Jesus, he is the baptizer. He is the anointed one. He is the one that can touch, the one that can fill, the one that can speak to you. If you're desiring a word of knowledge tonight, guess what? He is here and he's going to speak to you directly. So just pray with me. Just say, dear Jesus, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit and your fire. Jesus. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Oh, Lord, is my life. I want to be tried by fire. 
Try and buy. 